الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله والصحب أجمعين أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقة من لسان يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العلم الحكيم My dear respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome to part 26 of the Seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam series Insha'Allah today we will be discussing the events which took place after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, namely the Battle of Khaybar. Now before we talk about today's session, let's just have a quick recap about what we discussed in the previous session. So in the last session we talked about how Rasulullah decided to send letters to the kings and emperors of the neighbouring kingdoms. Rasulullah was then advised by his companions to create a seal for the letters. Because these letters were going to be sent to kings, they needed to look more official. And in order to look more official, they needed a seal. A seal was then created from silver, which had the words Allah, Rasul and Muhammad on it. We then heard how one of the companions, Dihya al-Kalbi radiallahu anhu, took a letter to Hiracle or Heraclius, the king of the Christian Byzantine Empire. Abu Sufyan, who at the time was an enemy of Islam, he happened to be in Sham and he was brought to Hiracle's court in Ilya or Jerusalem and there Hiracle questioned him about Rasulullah Abu Sufyan had no opportunity to lie and Hiracle admitted that Rasulullah was the true prophet who they had been waiting for. However, he didn't embrace Islam due to the fear of losing his kingdom. We also heard how letters were sent to other leaders as well, like Najashi, the emperor of Abyssinia, and he was one of the leaders who did embrace Islam. Also, Kisra, the leader of the Persian Empire, when he received the letter, he tore it up, and later on, he was killed by his own son. Some of his subjects, however, did embrace Islam. Then there was Muqawqis, the, Kip, the Coptic leader of Egypt. He received the letter with great respect, but he didn't embrace what he did do was send some gifts to Rasulullah including Maria Al-Qibtiya radiallahu anha. She gave birth to Rasulullah Ibrahim radiallahu anhu and he passed away while he was still in his infancy. Now let's just do a quick summary of the events which occurred in the sixth year of Hijrah. Now there are 28 events in total which we just going to discuss very very quickly. First of all, in the month of Muharram, the Sariya of Muhammad ibn Maslama radiallahu anhu was sent to Qurta. Remember, the expeditions in which Rasulullah was not a part of were called the Sariya. And the expeditions in which he was part of, in which he actually took part himself, they are called the Ghazwa or Ghazawat. Then in the month of Rabi al-Awwal, the Sariya of Aqasha ibn Mihsan al-Asadi radiallahu anhu was sent to Al-Ghamr. There they managed to get some spoils and return back safely. Then in the month of Rabi al-Akhir, again Muhammad ibn Maslama radiallahu anhu was sent to Dhul Qassa. All of the companions in that Sariya were martyred except Muhammad ibn Maslama radiallahu anhu who was brought back to Medina injured. Hazrat Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala anhu was then sent to Dhul Qassa where they managed to get some spoils and return safely. Then Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu was sent by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to the Banu Sulaym bil Jamu. There they managed to capture some prisoners, get some spoils and also return safely. In the month of Jamad al-Ula, Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu again was sent to Al-Is where they managed to get some spoils and come back safely. And thereafter the Ghazwa of Banu Luhyan took place which was on the borders of Uswan. During this Ghazwa, no one was encountered, so no actual fighting took place. Then, in the month of Jumad al-Akhirah, again, Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu was sent to al-Taf. There again, they managed to get some spoils and come back safely. Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu was then sent on to Hisma, also in this month. After that, in the month of Rajab, Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu was then sent to Wadi al qura Again, when they got there, they didn't encounter anyone. In the month of Sha'ban, Abdul Rahman ibn al-Awf radiallahu anhu was sent to Dhumatul Jandal. 
He was ordered by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to marry the daughter of their leader. She embraced Islam and then he married her. Then in the same month, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was sent to the Banu Sa'ad ibn Bakr in Fadak. There they managed to get some spoils and return back safely. Following the month of Sha'ban, in the month of Ramadan, Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu was sent to Umm Qirfa, which was on the boundaries of Wadi al qura Here they managed to capture some prisoners, get some spoils and come back safely. And during this month, there was a severe drought and Rasulullah prayed for rain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then answered his prayer prayers. Following the month of Ramadan, in the month of Shawwal, Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu was sent to Usair ibn Zarim, or Zarim, where they completed their task and returned safely. Then Quruz ibn Jabir al-Fihriri radiallahu anhu was sent to Uraniyin. There, basically, they brought this person to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and Rasulullah sallallahu personally put an end to him. Also in this year, before the Treaty of al hudaybiyya the Syria of al khabd took place. Also in this month, the Syria of Banu Absin also took place. In the month of Dhul Qa'dah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah was agreed. And the Pledge of Ridwan, which took place under the Asasiya tree during the time of Hudaybiyyah, also took place. And when they were returning from Hudaybiyyah, near a place called Dajnan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah al fat to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he in turn recited to his companions. Other events that happened in this year, the pilgrimage, the Hajj became Farad. Also, Muslim women could no longer marry polytheists. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sent letters to all the kings in the neighbouring kingdoms inviting them to Islam. A solar eclipse also took place in this year. Also, in this year, the rule of Zihar was also revealed. Sa'ad ibn Khawla radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed away while he was imprisoned in Mecca. And also in this year, the delegation of Judam came to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now let's move on to the main event which we want to talk about today. And this was the Battle of Khaybar. When the Muslims were back or on their way back from Hudaybiyah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah al fat in which he promised the Muslims lots of victories and lots of bounties. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَدَكُمُ اللَّهُ مَغَانِمَ كَثِيرَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you many spoils. تَأْخُذُونَهَا that you would receive. فَعَجَّلَ لَكُمْ هَذِهِ So he gave these to you sooner. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the verse, so he gave these to you sooner, from this he meant the victory over Khaybar, which we shall discuss today. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, arrived back in Medina and stayed there for the month of Dhul Hijjah and the month of Muharram. It was now the seventh year of Hijri. In this time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa received the command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to Khaybar. Now, where was Khaybar? Khaybar was a stronghold approximately 150 kilometers north of Medina, as you can see from the slide in front of you. It was populated by Jews, including the people from the tribe of Banu Nadir, who had been expelled from Medina after breaking their treaty with the Muslims. The Jews from Khaybar had gone to Makkah to encourage the Quraysh to take up arms against the Muslims, which resulted in the battle of the confederates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that when the hypocrites hear news of victory over Khaybar, they will also want to join the army of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to go there because they also want to have a share. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command was that these people should not go with him, meaning not go with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa under any circumstance. And he sent down the following revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sayaqulu al-mukhallafoon. Those who remain behind will say, إِذَا انْطَلَقْتُمْ إِلَى مَغَانِمَ لِتَأْخُذُهَا ذَرُنَا نَتَّبِعْكُمْ When you will proceed to the spoils of war to receive them, let us follow you. 
يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يُبَدِّلُوا كَلَامَ اللَّهِ They wish to change the words of Allah. قُلْ لَنْ تَتَّبِعُنَا كَذَلِكُمْ قَالَ اللَّهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ They wish to change the words of Allah. Say, you shall not follow us. Allah had said like this beforehand. فَسَيَقُولُونَ بَلْ تَحْسُدُونَهَا Then they will say, no, but you are jealous of us. بَلْ كَانُوا لَا يَفْقَحُونَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا on the contrary, they do not understand the reality, but a little. So at the end of the month of Muharram, Rasulullah wasallam set out with 1,400 foot soldiers and 200 cavalry, meaning soldiers with horses, towards Khaybar. And from his wives, Umm Salama radiallahu anha accompanied him. Now you can see from this map the path Rasulullah wasallam took from Medina north to Khaybar. He left Numaila ibn Abdullah al-Layfi radiallahu anhu in charge in Medina. And he gave the standard of the army, the flag of the army to Ali radiallahu anhu. And the standard was white in color. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa knew that the Jews from Ghatfan had gathered an army to help the people of Khaybar. So he stopped at maqam al Raji' which is halfway between Ghutfan and Khaybar. When the people of Ghutfan realized that they were under risks themselves, they turned back. Now in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Kitab al-Maghazi, the book of military expeditions, there is a hadith which tells us about one of the companions of Rasulullah whose name was Amir ibn al-Aqwa radiallahu anhu. Now, Salama ibn al-Aqwa radiallahu anhu narrates that we went out to Khaybar in the company of the Prophet ﷺ. While we were proceeding at night, a man from the group said to Amir radiallahu anhu, O oh Amir, won't you let us hear your poetry? Amir radiallahu anhu was a poet, so he got down and started reciting for the people poetry that kept pace with the camel's footsteps, saying, اللهم لولا أنت محتدينا ولا تصدقنا ولا صلينا Oh Allah, without you we would not have been guided on the right path Neither would we have given in charity Nor would we have prayed فاغفر فداء لك ما أبقينا وثبت الأقدام إن لاقينا So please forgive us what we have committed Meaning our defects and let us all be sacrificed for your cause. And make our feet firm when we meet our enemy. And send sakina, which means calmness, tranquility upon us. And if they will call us towards an unjust thing, we will refuse. The infidels have made a hue and cry to ask help against others. Rasulullah then asked, Who is that? Meaning, who is a camel driver reciting the poetry? The people said, He is Amir ibn al Aqwa. Rasulullah then said, May Allah bestow his mercy on him. A man amongst the people, meaning Umar, then said, O oh Allah's Prophet, has martyrdom been granted to him? Would that you let us enjoy his company longer? Because Amir was well liked, he was strong. Yeah, they would have liked that he would have stayed with the Sahabas longer. But from the words of Rasulullah they could tell that he had been given martyrdom or promised martyrdom. Amir ibn al-Aqwa was then martyred on the day of Khaybar. When the Muslim army got near Khaybar, Rasulullah commanded the Sahaba to stop and he then recited this dua. Rasulullah said, Allahumma rabba samawati wa ma adlalna. O oh Allah, Lord of the heavens and what it covers. Wa rabba al-aradina wa ma aqlalna. And the Lord of the earth and what it holds. Wa rabba al-shayateen wa ma adlalna. And the Lord of the shayateen and those who deceive others. Wa rabba al-riyahi wa ma adharayna. And the Lord of the winds and what they spread. فَإِنَّا نَسْأَلُكَ خَيْرَ هَذِهِ الْقَرْيَةِ وَخَيْرَ أَحْلِهَا وَخَيْرَ مَا فِيهَا Indeed, we ask you for good from this city, and good 
from its people and good from whatever is in it. And we ask refuge from you from its evil and the evil from its people and the evil from within the city. Enter with the name of Allah. It was a habit of Rasulullah that he would recite this dua whenever he entered any locality. Again in Sahih al-Bukhari, Anas radiallahu anhu narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa arrived at Khaybar at night. His habit was that he would never attack at night time but would wait for the daytime. If he heard the adhan, he wouldn't attack because that would show that there were Muslims there. Otherwise, he would. In this way, he waited until the morning to see if he could hear the adhan. When he didn't hear it, he prepared to attack. In the morning, the people of Khaybar came out to work with their spades and shovels. And when they saw the Muslim army approaching, they said, Muhammad wal Khamis, which meant that Muhammad وسلم, has arrived wal Khamis with his whole army. And the reason why they used the word Khamis was because an army comprises normally of five different parts. Rasulullah saw them and raised his hands. He then supplicated and he said, Kharibat Khaybaru. Khaybar is destroyed. Inna idha nazalna bisahatin qawmin. For whenever we approach a hostile nation to fight, fasa'a sabahul munzareen, then evil will be the morning for those who have been warned. The people who had come out to work then hurried back and locked themselves in their forts with their families. Now the people of Khaybar lived in many different forts. You can see from the red arrows the path that the Muslim army took from Medina to Khaybar. Rasulullah then started attacking the forts one after the other, which fell one after another. And the first fort to fall was the fort of Naim. Mahmud ibn Maslima radiallahu anhu was near the fort when he was struck by an object which was thrown from it. Mahmud ibn Maslama radiallahu anhu was martyred as a result. After the fort of Naim was conquered, next was the fort of Al Qamus. This was one of the most fortified of all the forts in Khaybar and belonged to the Banu Abu Al Huqaiq. When the assault started on the fort, Rasulullah was not well, so he did not go onto the battlefield. Therefore, he sent Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu with the standard. Despite all of his efforts, they were unable to take the fort, so he returned. The following day, Rasulullah gave the standard to Umar anhu and sent him to the battlefield. Again, he tried his best, but was unable to take the fort, so he also returned. Rasulullah then said that tomorrow I will give the standard to that person who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger love him as well. Victory will be on his hand. The whole night was spent with every person eagerly waiting to see if they were the one that Rasulullah was talking about. In the morning, Rasulullah called Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu at that time was having a problem with his eyes. Rasulullah put his blessed saliva on the eyes of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and supplicated for him. As soon as he done this, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu's eyes became better as if he had never had a problem in the first place. Rasulullah gave him the standard and advised him to first invite the people towards Islam and also inform them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rights. Rasulullah said, By Allah, even if one person is guided through you, then it is better for you than red camels. Ali radiallahu anhu took the standard and went to the battlefield. Now, one of the famous brave soldiers of the people of Khaybar was called Marhab. He came out to challenge the Muslims, and Amir ibn Akwa radiallahu anhu came out to meet him. So he was the camel driver who recited the poetry. Amir radiallahu anhu aimed a strike at Marhab's legs but missed and the sword, his own sword, hit his own knee which resulted in his martyrdom. 
Ali radiallahu anhu then went out to meet Murhab and defeated him. Murhab's brother Yasir then came out and Zubayr radiallahu anhu came forward to meet him. Zubayr radiallahu anhu then made sure that Yasir met the same fate as his brother. The siege of this fort lasted for 20 days and finally the fort fell to the Muslims at the hand of Ali radiallahu anhu. Apart from the spoils of war, lots of captives were also taken. Among them was Safiya radiallahu anha, the daughter of Hay ibn Akhtab, the leader of the Banu Nadir and the wife of Kinana ibn al-Rabi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa chose Safiya radiallahu anha for himself. After the fort of Qamus was captured, the fort of Al-Sa'ab ibn Ma'ad was captured. This fort had lots of grain and fat and other food stuff which was captured by the Muslims. On this day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi he saw lots of fires being lit. He inquired what this was and he was told that they were cooking meat. He asked what meat are they cooking and he was told that it was the meat of domestic donkeys. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi then told them that this meat was unclean. Throw it all away and also break your bowls. Someone then said, O oh, Rasulullah, what if we throw away the meat and just wash the bowls? Do we have permission for this? Rasulullah said, You can wash your bowls. So you can see from this day, the meat of domesticated donkeys was made haram, it was made impermissible. After this, the people sought refuge in the fort of Hisan. This was also well fortified. It was on top of a mountain, that is why it was called the fort of Hisan. Later on, the fort of Hisan would be called the fort of Zubayr radiallahu anhu as the fort came in his share when the spoils of war were distributed. So for three days, the Muslims laid siege to the fort and it just so happened that a Jew came to Rasulullah and said that even if you laid siege to them for one month, it doesn't matter to them. They have a natural spring under their land, so they come out at night and collect the water then they return to their forts. If you stop their water supply, then you may be successful. Rasulullah stopped their water and they had no choice but to come out and fight. A fierce confrontation took place in which 10 of their men's lives were taken and some companions also were martyred before the fort was captured. After this, Rasulullah made his way to the remaining forts. The fort of Watih and Salalim. All the people from the other forts who had been captured arrived there and f sorry, who had been captured, they arrived there and fortified themselves inside. The Muslims laid siege to the forts and after 14 days they had no choice but to ask Rasulullah to come to terms which Rasulullah agreed. The people of Khaybar sent Abi al Ibn Abi al-Haqiq to set the terms of the treaty. Rasulullah granted them terms on the basis that they would all leave Khaybar. They would also leave their gold, their silver and their weapons. They cannot hide and take anything. Now even though a truce had been made, a bag which belonged to Hay ibn Akhtab which contained all of the jewellery went missing. Rasulullah called Kinana ibn al-Rabi and asked him, where had it gone? Kinana replied that it had been spent towards the war effort. Rasulullah said that it hasn't been that long and there was a lot of wealth in that bag. Other people were also asked and they all gave the same answer that it had been spent. Rasulullah then warned them that it would not be good if the bag turned up. He called one of his companions and instructed him to go to a certain place where a bag had been hidden under the, or in the roots of the tree. The companion went to this tree and he found the bag. And the total wealth in that bag was equivalent to 10,000 dinars. And due to this crime, these people paid the ultimate price and among them was the husband of Safiya radiallahu anha, Kinana ibn ar Rabi. Kinana ibn ar Rabi had also killed Mahmud ibn Maslama radiallahu anhu the brother of Muhammad ibn Maslama radiallahu anhu. So due to these crimes, 
Kinana was handed over to Muhammad ibn Maslama anhu so he could pass sentence on him. When the people of Fadak found out that the people of Khaybar had come to terms with Rasulullah they also sent a request to him. They said that they or they said that they will leave the area and leave all of their wealth behind. Rasulullah accepted these terms. Now because Fadak had been taken without any hostilities, without the need for an army, no cavalry was needed, no infantry was needed. Therefore the wealth that was left behind was exclusively for Rasulullah and he was free to do with it what he wished. In this expedition, 14 or 15 companions were martyred and 93 disbelievers fell. When the captives were gathered, Safiya radiallahu anha, the daughter of Hay ibn Akhtab, the wife of Kinan ibn Rabi' was also present. Hay ibn Akhtab was from the descendants of Harun alayhi salam. And when the captives were gathered, Dihya radiallahu anhu asked to be given a captive. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave him a choice. So he went and chose Safiya radiallahu anha. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu then said to him, that this was a daughter of the leader and she would be more suitable for yourself, meaning for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then took her back from Dihya radiallahu anhu and gave him her cousin sister instead. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then freed Safiya radiallahu anha and married her. After the victory at Khaybar, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa spent a few days there. And during this day, Zainab bint Harith the wife of Salam ibn Mashkam sent a roasted goat as a gift to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Before she sent the goat, she inquired as to which part of the goat does Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi like the most. She was told that it was the arm. So what did she do? She put lots of poison in this part. She then poisoned the rest of the goat. The goat was then put in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and as soon as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi tasted it. He stopped eating. One of his companions, Bishr ibn Bara ibn Ma'roon radiallahu anhu, was with Rasulullah at the time and he ate a little of it. Rasulullah told him to stop eating and said that this goat had been poisoned. Zainab was called and asked about the goat. She admitted that it had been poisoned. She was then asked why had she poisoned it. And the reason she gave was that if Rasulullah was a true prophet, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would inform him and if he was not then the people would be relieved of him. In a narration in Bayhaqi it mentions that after this incident Zainab embraced Islam. Now the companion who was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Bishr ibn Bara ibn Ma'mur radiallahu anhu passed away as a result of eating this poisoned food and due to this Zainab was handed over to his family who then passed sentence on her. Rasulullah had agreed terms with the people of Khaybar and the terms were that they were to leave their land. However, later on they came to Rasulullah and they said, can they be allowed to stay in their land? And in return, half of the produce that they would make would be given to Rasulullah Rasulullah then agreed to this. When the time used to come to share the produce, Rasulullah used to send Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu. He would divide all of the produce into two shares and then he would tell the people of Khaybar first to take whichever share they want so they would get the first option. This act really impressed the people of Khaybar. Now the spoils of Khaybar, there was no gold or silver in the bounty. There were oxen, camel and some goods. The greatest asset was the land and the orchards. Apart from the land and orchards, the rest was divided accordingly amongst the Muslims. However, the land was only given to those people who were present in Hudaybiyah. So how was this land divided? Again, we look at the hadith and there is one hadith in Sunan Abu Dawood which mentions how the actual land was divided. Anna Rasulullah Sahman. 
جمع كل سحم مئة سحم فكان لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وللمسلمين النصف من ذلك وعزل النصف الباقية لما نزل به من الوفود والأمور ونواء بالناس The hadith mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shared out the land into 36 lots and each of these lots had 100 portions 100 sahmin one half of it was for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims and the other half was for the deputations that came to him other matters and the emergent needs of the people now how was the booty, the bounty distributed amongst the Muslims? Again in Sunan Abu Dawood, there's another narration which mentions that there were 1500 soldiers in the army, out of which 300 were cavalry. Earlier on we heard the number was slightly different. Now each member of the cavalry got two shares. Why? Because they also had a horse as well. So they would get two shares and each member of the infantry, those people, those soldiers who never had a uh, animal to ride on they got one share so that made 1800 shares in total now when the muhajirun first arrived in Medina the Ansar had given them some land and orchard so that they could work on them and have mutual benefit after the conquest of Khaybar the muhajirun were no longer in need of assistance so they returned the lands and orchards which had been given to them by the Ansar Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had been given some trees by the mother of Anas radiallahu anhu, Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha. Rasulullah in turn had given these trees to Umm Ayman radiallahu anha. Now remember Umm Ayman radiallahu anha had looked after Rasulullah when he was a child. So Anas radiallahu anha, his mother, Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha, now asked Rasulullah if she could also get her trees back because all the other companions were getting their land back can she also get her trees back as well those trees had been given to Umm Ayman but she initially refused to give them back Rasulullah then gave Umm Ayman 10 trees in exchange for each of Umm Sulaim's trees and this is how the trees were returned to Umm Sulaim again in the early days, a group of Muslims had migrated to Abyssinia and amongst these was the cousin of Rasulullah ﷺ, Ja'far anhu. When they found out that Rasulullah ﷺ had migrated to Medina, many of them left Abyssinia and they came to Medina to join Rasulullah ﷺ. Amongst them, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud anhu arrived in Medina at the time when they were preparing for the Battle of Badr. Now the cousin of Rasulullah as I mentioned earlier, Ja'far arrived with some companions on the day the conquest of Khaybar had been completed. Rasulullah embraced him, kissed him on the forehead. After a while he said that I don't know if I am happier due to the conquest of Khaybar or by Ja'far coming. Again, in a hadith mentioned it says an Abi Musa qala qadimna an al nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam ba'da an iftataha khaybar fa qasam lana wa lam yaqsim li ahd lam yashhad al fath ghayrana Abu Musa al Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu narrates that when we arrived in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam when Khaybar had been defeated from the bounties we were given we were also given a share apart from us no one else who had been who had not been present in Khaybar was given a share and this hadith can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari so let's just quickly summarize the things that we talked about today today we mainly talked about the battle of Khaybar Khaybar was a Jewish stronghold north of Medina and they had been instrumental the people there had been instrumental in encouraging the Quraysh to take up arms against the Muslims and this resulted in the battle of the Confederates the battle of Khandaq the battle of trench or battle of the trench Rasulullah was then ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to Khaybar and he had been promised victory. The people of Khaybar lived in forts and one by one they were all defeated and finally they came to terms with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The initial agreement was that they would leave the land but later on they asked if they could stay and cultivate it and in return they would give half of their produce to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and this was then agreed upon. One of the captives was Safiya radiallahu anha 
the daughter of Hay ibn Akhtab, the leader of the Banu Nadir. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam freed her, then he married her. The general spoils were then shared out amongst the Muslims, but the land was reserved for only those companions who had been present in Hudaybiyah. Rasulullah then consolidated his authority in the area by defeating other tribes and by them also surrendering and coming to terms. The spoils allowed the Muhajirun of Mecca to return the lands that were given to them by the Ansar when they had first migrated to Medina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them the first victory. He had promised when Surah al fat was revealed and this would now be followed by many more which we will inshallah discuss later on. Jazakallah khair wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.